And here's a question to get you started. All right. What can you tell us about Henry Highland Garnett? What is it about him that made him important in black politics? Henry Highland Garnett was the first recognized black political leader, party leader in American history. And I want to be clear about this, and this is, is, is in the 1840s. Lots of black men had been active in party politics as far back as, really, the late 1780s. Prince Hall, who was the founder of the Black Mason Masonic mm -hmm. Organization, was leading his men to the polls in the late 1780s in Boston, as noted by a very Jeremy Belknap, a great historian. So um, up in New England, in New York, black men are very active, and there are leaders, and they're recognized, but they're not party leaders. They're not integrated into the actual official, at the, at the highest level party structures, okay? Um, this changes, and Garnett is, you know, something is different when you get to the 1840s. And here's why it changes, and this, is, I think, has a certain resonance now if we think about how party politics work. Um, in, the late, in the 1830s, when radical, immediate abolition gets going, there'd always been abolitionism, but really radical, like immediate, uncompensated, uh, emancipation. That's the 1830s. That's William Lloyd Garrison. Mm -hmm. People have heard of him, right? Nearly all abolitionists, white, and nearly all free black men who can vote, and there are quite a few of them around the North, are Whigs. They are in a party. They're in a big mass party that includes slaveholders like Henry Clay, the most famous Whig. Yes, free black men are mostly Whigs. Why? This is the residence now, because they can't be Democrats. He's the Democrats of the party of Andrew Jackson. To put it in completely anachronistic terms, mm -hmm. they're the party of white nationalism. And black men are not going to be Jackson men. And the Whigs are a party in the North that includes, you know, you look and you say, well, who's anti-slavery? John Quincy Adams is anti-slavery. He flays the slaveholders. So most free black men are Whigs, and most white abolitionists are Whigs. Even the Garrisonians, they dissemble, they pretend they're not, but mostly they're Whigs. By 1840, this is the point of Garnett, and as I said, if you think about how party politics now, some of these white abolitionists and the free black men are beginning to get tired of being Whigs, because that means they have to keep voting for slaveholders like Henry Clay at the national level, and the Whigs keep compromising. So some of them split. They form the Liberty Party, which in fact is one of the most effective third parties in American history. This is a radical anti-slavery party. No compromise. Not just immediate emancipation, full citizenship. Black people are Americans just like everybody else. And this is the claim that Garnett in particular made very strongly. I use one of his speeches as the heading for the first chapter in my book. The line of the speech, which is repeated by Douglas and everyone else, is we are Americans, Orthodox Protestants, born on the soil, served our country. So here's Garnett, 24. This party's been formed. It's a space for him to move into. He and several other of the cohort you and I are going to discuss um, in New York City and New York State move into the Liberty Party and rapidly get named to party committees at national nominating conventions, um, be, are recognized or give, give speeches. His cousin Samuel Ringel Ward is, gives the official benediction at the 1841 National Liberty Party Convention. Now. This is a complicated answer, but this is the essence of the talk I would give if I were giving a formal lecture. Um, it used to be said that the Liberty Party, you know, there's a certain bias among traditional historians, political scientists. Well, all that matters is the major parties because bipartisan two-party is written into the Constitution, which is not true at all. Right. So they disregard. The Liberty Party, the newer history shows, actually deeply threatened the existing party system in certain parts of the North, in New England, where you need an absolute majority to win a seat. You don't win it with the plurality. You need 50 plus one to win a seat any in almost any of the New England legislatures or Congress. <laughs> this is an opportunity. That means you can spoil with three or four or five percent. In New York and in New England and in Ohio, exactly the places that are the focus of my book where free black men have real political weight, the Liberty Party starts spoiling. They make both parties come towards them. They severely dampen the chances of Whigs in state and local races, which is what most people care about then, because most politics is done at the states. So this is an opportunity for Henry Highland Garnett, who is one of the most <laughs> Byronic, audacious figures I've ever studied. He moves straight into leadership in the Liberty Party. In 1843, 
he accomplishes what I would call a trifecta. In August of 1843, he goes to the first national black convention held in eight years. The conventions of the early 30s are not political at all. There were five black political conventions, national ones. They weren't political. There hadn't been very three years since they were so they weren't very effective. The first national black political convention, Garnett shows, and right away pushes through a resolution that all black men should vote for the Liberty Party. This is an extremely serious thing to do. And again, this is a serious answer I'm giving you. Because then voting is very popular, public. You watch, you see what paper a man hands you, and you walk up and put it in the box. If the free black men in New England and New York and Ohio start voting for the Liberty Party, that is going to free up a larger number of white men to say, well, I'll go with them. That sounds like a good anti-slavery vote. And remember, all the people we're talking about are Bible Christians. They are very morally motivated. Like, what is, how do you vote for the slave? So Garnett goes to the National Black Convention, overrules the Garrisonians, like Frederick Douglass, who are anti-politics, and takes the National Black Convention over the Liberty Party. He leaves there. He goes to the New York State Convention. Every year in New York State, which is the center of black politics, they have a statewide convention. Black men come from a majority of the New York counties. They are organized all over New York State, highly organized. He goes in there and swings the New York State Convention, which is full of black Whigs who are not happy about this. They don't want to stay in a major party. He swings them over to the Liberty Party. Then uh, he goes to the Liberty Party Convention. Do I have the order of these things right? It doesn't matter. He does it all at one. And he goes to the Liberty Party convention. He calls a caucus. It's reported widely in the white press. And the Liberty Party passes a resolution, formally welcomed their colored fellow citizens. That was the term of respect, colored, into the Liberty Party. And he gives a major address, a very major address, which actually one of his both schoolmates and lifelong friends and rivals, the first black physician, Dr. James McCune Smith, right. they knew each other for decades, says it was the best speech he'd ever given. That's saying a lot, given that Henry Highland Garnett could match wits with anyone, even Douglas as an orator. 